Okay. So, hi everybody. This is so exciting. Welcome to All Brains Belong's first ever hybrid brain club. Um, we have a whole bunch of people here at the State House lawn. We have a whole bunch of people here on Zoom, and none of these things are a default. We are going to try as best we can to create an equivalent experience in Zoom land and in real life, um, because this way, because um, I, I know my personal experience is that like lots of times I'm the Zoom participant when something is happening somewhere on site, and I feel othered because I'm like the extra watching. So we are we are going to try to have this be meaningful to all the people. Oh, I should introduce myself. Feedback coming in. It looks like. Oh, okay. Um, where do you think the feet, what's the source of the feedback? No. How about now, is it any better? Okay, all right. Um, I realize I didn't even introduce myself. I don't know everybody who's in Zoom land, um, so I will say hi. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I am you, she, they pronouns. I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong. And I am joined by my colleague, Sierra Miller. Um, and you can have this on your lap. And here you go. Hi, everybody. I'm Sierra Miller. Um, I am a nurse practitioner at All Brains Belong. And I'm really excited for this hybrid Brain Club. Um, yeah, it's really nice to see people in person and it's nice to see people on video and it's a beautiful day out. Awesome. So as we kick off um, this uh, first um, of a series of three topics where um, uh, of, about neurodiversity and the double empathy problem. I thought I just wanted to say a little bit about what the double empathy problem is um, and how this fits into everyday life. And then we will start our conversation about neurodiversity and relationships. So the double empathy problem is a term that was coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who is um, a, uh, an, an autistic um, researcher in the UK. And this term refers to, like, there's not a one right way to communicate. It's that there's a mismatch of worldview, a mismatch of communication styles, um, where, um, and, and, and in his original study, um, 10 years ago looked at uh, neurodivergent people um, communicating with one another versus communicating with neurotypical people um, and neurotypical people communicating with each other and with neurodivergent people and turns out that both groups had a really hard time understanding one another um, and it's not that uh, that that one group of people have like social skills deficits it's it's um I think our zoom maybe crashed I'm still on it. You're still on it? Okay, great. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> this is what I do. Um, anyway, um, so uh, again, it's not that there's like one default way of being a person and everyone else has deficits. It's that really it's about zooming way out and um, struggling to perspective take. Um, even people with brains who think, learn, communicate um, like the majority of brains can often really struggle with perspective taking of folks who think learn communicate differently than them. And so um, how this impact, how this fits into relationships is it's like everything. It fits into literally every aspect of relationships. Um, and this can be, we can be talking about relationships like friendships and romantic partnerships, like all, all kinds of things. And so I am, I'm, I'm, I'm curious and we can, we can start with the folks in, in on Zoom. Um, what is, uh, what's jumping out for you? Um, what, what, uh, how does perspective taking impact your relationships in your lives? And feel free to um, type in the chat or unmute and speak. And actually, if I turn my, if any of us turn our speakers on, Finn, what's going to happen? It'll make a feedback. We don't want to do that. So if people talk, they're going to come out of those speakers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyone who's going to speak in Zoom world, we can all hear you. Um, and maybe 
Do you think that you could give the Zoom folks a view of the crowd? And if anyone does not want to be on camera here, feel free to come on this side. Uh, sure, I can ask the question again. Um, uh, so when we think about perspective taking in relationships, is that hard? Is that easy? Is it, uh, what's been your experience? I see in the, I see in the chat that this is everything. Laura. Hardest parts in a, my relationship is that when we're not on the same page, we often don't know we're on the same page until the conflict happens. So we think we're on the same page, but we're not, we're not and that's what, that's what the trouble, trouble. That, that assumption making, I think. Yeah, um, I, I think, thank you for saying that. I think that's, that's, that's very, very common um, where, um, not being on the same page um it's easy it's easy to not be on the same page for sure um how about how about anybody here perspective perspective taking um in relationships where if you have the kind of brain that maybe has a mismatch of communication style with someone else in your relationships how does that how does that play out for you Linda. Sometimes I find that I Hold on, I gotta give you the, I gotta ah. give you the microphone. I forgot oh, that was my job. Sorry. Oh, there's one at the table. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sometimes I find that things I assumed to be self-evident are not to the other person and things that they have assumed are self-evident are not to me. You're gonna say something? I don't know how you noticed that, but <laughs> vibe. I felt your vibe. Um, hello. Um, something I was thinking about with this theme is um, when you do have that communication breakdown, so there's friction happening, but you're not talking about the friction, um, it becomes very easy to put a lot of that weight on yourself and think that the um, communication mismatch is like your fault like you're like that went so poorly blah 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 when really it's like both parties or all parties like have their own needs and have their own styles so um yeah cool amazing um in the chat uh leah says it can be really difficult to communicate with people because many people don't want to say what they mean or mean what they say oh Is this working? Can people hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, this is Sierra. Just one thing that this makes me think of is one of my favorite metaphors about neurodivergence is comes from the podcast Black Girl Lost Keys, um, and she talks about specifically ADHD as a uh, Mac in a world built for PCs oh, and how they so both cute. are really great operating systems but it's difficult to communicate across those operating systems and it's difficult for a Mac to work in a world um, that's built not for them um, and I also think that one thing I've been thinking about recently is how there's a uh, um, there's an assumption of the kind of steps of a relationship, whether we're talking about kind of a relationship escalator in terms of romantic relationships, or just kind of how intimate certain relationships should be. And I think that um, for myself, at least for my brain, um, it can be really hard to figure out how intimate a relationship is supposed to be for the other person. And often it comes across as me either being too interested in the person or too uninterested in the person. Um, and thinking that I don't share the same thing. Oh, just thinking that I don't like I don't want to be in the relationship, or I want a different type of relationship with somebody. Um, whether it's a friendship who 
is expecting us to talk once a week and I'm thinking, oh, I want to talk every day or I'm somebody who wants to talk once a month. And those are all valid ways to communicate, but there's an assumption of this type of relationship needs this sort of communication or this type of relationship needs this level of intimacy. Yeah. I think that's really complicated. Yeah, um, and uh, so, uh, often people share with me that they're that they get feedback from the people in their lives about that there's a right and a wrong way to interact like that it only counts if you are going out to dinner like it only counts if you are in real life real life like as though it's not real life to have a connection with someone um on a zoom meeting or a phone meeting or that you go five years without interacting as long as it you, you pick up where you left off kind of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering for, for we, can, we can we start with the folks here. Um, has anyone found anything helpful, some strategies about um, perspective taking when you're communicating with someone, when you're in any kind of relationship that you just you, you you know you're not on the same page anything but helpful um in the in the chat yeah, yeah. um in the chat we have um laura saying i once talked to a really happy neuro mixed couple um who live apart monday through friday and together on weekends and it worked really great for their needs um i think that's a really great example of making relationship structures non-traditional to work with everybody's brain um, when my, my husband's sitting here, um, when, when we met, um, so like when S Sierra gave the example, um, uh, of like, there's no right way to like the stages of a relationship on our first date. Um, no, it was our, it was our second date that we like covered our like goals of care and our advanced, our advanced directives. Like we just like got to it, like just boom. And actually on our second date, I had said, um, we're, we're probably gonna get married. And like that was not typical. <laughs> um, uh, but <laughs> just just got to the point. Um, <laughs> my partner and I did the same thing. Yeah. Yep. I don't mean to have my back to you, Matt. No, 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 don't worry. I'm just Yeah, because yeah, I'm so tall. I'm blocking the sun for you. Yeah, yeah. I'm 4'11 um, for those in, in Zoom land. Anyway. <laughs> Um, I I I th I think even in um, when even in really long term relationships where people really know each other very well, there's still a lot of brain rules. Um, so for those, there's a, there's a couple folks um, who've not been to Brain Club before. Um, I talk a lot about brain rules versus world rules. Brain rules are like the thing you think are universal life truth, but you really made them up or someone made them up when you were a kid and like lots of people made them up and kind of passed them along versus world rules of, you know, <laughs> don't hit people in the head. They don't like it. Um, um, but uh, you know, I, I, there's another, another, there's, there's more people in the chat that they, they, they knew they were gonna, they were gonna marry um, their partners on the first, yeah, that's right, just get to the point, right, anyway, um, but um, brain rules in relationships are totally a thing, like, I had so many brain rules, like, I, loved when people could predict and anticipate my needs, so it was like a brain rule that like, if you really care about me, you're gonna read my mind, um, that's a brain rule. It's, it's, it's a world rule that people have access needs and that you're supposed to communicate them to people and that... <laughs> I absolutely agree. I think that there's a lot of brain rules, both that come from, like, the view of what your relationship should look like on the outside and the view of how you and a partner, whether we're talking about romantic partner, friendship, a uh, relationship with a parent or other family member should look. Um, and I think, I think about this, oh, it looks like Laura, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off, Sierra. You can no, finish no. the thought. I was just <laughs> rambling. <laughs> I, I think if I'm being honest, I think a big challenge for me was overcoming what I thought other people would think of my relationship. Um, like I can think of an example way early on that 
instead of getting me a bouquet of flowers, my partner got me a pack of pansies that you would like plant in the ground. And I remember being like horrified, like who would get this? Like I, if you're getting somebody flowers, you get them a bouquet of flowers. And when we talked about it, he was like, well, you can plant those and they're going to stay alive and you could keep them. Like, I thought it was nice. And I was like mad because I'm like, how am I going to walk in and show my parents? Like, this is what my boyfriend got me instead of these beautiful flowers. And I think it took me a long time to, and I think I'm still working on it, to accept pansies and, and love pansies and not be, not be imag imagining that, that assumed, like, I, I, I love the pansies, but it was a fear of what other people would think of the way our relationship looked. Um, and I think that has taken a lot of time to try and sort out those brain rules versus world rules and what works for us versus what other people want to see. Thank you, Laura. I think that's a really great point that um, I think that I talk about a this a lot with um, like LGBTQ and queer relationships. And I think it's talked a lot about in that sense of um, sometimes your relationship doesn't look like what you thought it would or what other people thought it would. And it's OK to grieve that sometimes. And it's OK to feel like even though this is a great thing and I'm really happy in this relationship, like I'm really happy with the pansies, but it's OK to feel a little unsettled by that. And it's OK to feel um, whether you're grieving the loss of a future self that you thought you would be or whatever it ends up being, um, it's okay to feel a little unsettled about that. And that doesn't mean that everything's horrible and you're doing everything wrong. I think you have to assume that you're going to run into a bunch of brain rules. If you know that up front, it helps a lot, a lot, you know, you know, because I remember I shaved off my beard on one date and Trudy didn't even, she was on the date and she wouldn't even kiss me goodbye. She was like, totally had a, just an, a weird emotional reaction to that. And um, so, yeah, anyway, you're, you're going to run into them. And I think if you just accept that that's part of it, then you're going to work through it. It helps a lot. That's definitely helped for this. Um. I always, um, when I'm working with clients and, um, oh, no worries. Um, when, I, uh, when I'm working with clients and, and um, I talk about uh, this with uh, people in my own life too, um, a great way um, to foster communication is to talk um, not, you don't have to get specific about any given subject, but talking about values is relating to it. Um, um, and that, can, can well it can provide a, a broader understanding and um, if there's a conflict happening it can lift you above the conflict to what really matters um, oh I love electronics <laughs> uh oh, <coughs> uh -oh. We're back testing. Okay. Um, yeah, that's just my my uh, my little trick of late. Um, instead of talking about the specific subject, talk about how you feel about it, or uh, um, delve into you know um, your reasoning, or, or you know broaden the conversation. Thank you for that. Um, one thing, so so I, I, I feel like so much of my own, because I, I thought I was neurotypical until like a year and a half ago, and um, I feel like I've learned so much about my, like develop my identity through social media, of like seeing total strangers like articulate my innermost thoughts like in an infographic, like, whoa, I would never have been able to find the language to articulate this like deep part of my identity thanks random stranger on instagram um but anyway um uh, i saw this 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 post a few months ago that i have personally found very helpful and that i've shared with a bunch of people and i'm gonna share with everyone so a lot of times with um uh like 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 uh, communication guidance it's about like the i statements or like just like like a specific way that there's like a right way to communicate about yourself and like that didn't really ever work for me um so this one when you said this the story i told myself 
was this. Whoa! And that has been really helpful because it doesn't have to be rational. It doesn't have to be the same as theirs. It's just like, I'm telling you the truth. My truth is that the story, I told myself a story and it was this. And that, that's, that's gone a long way. We have some, we got some nodding heads here. Um, and someone is, and, and a couple people in the chat saying, uh, yes, I've had that experience too. Um, yeah. Um, how about in, in Zoom world, any strategies that anyone else has found helpful about to support perspective taking in, in relationships? Talking about literally everything. That's in the chat. Yeah, um, in, and, and um, sometimes it's about finding the right time and the right, um, the right approach to talking about something or communicating about something. Like in my, in my relationship, I don't know where my husband went. He left without communicating. Um, but okay, great. <laughs> um, but, but like, he has the kind of brain that like legit hates to talk about things. Like it's the auditorial, auditory processing that is hard, but like, you know, we could write emails, so we can communicate about all the things, but not in like, um, uh, often when there's a mismatch between like, I have the kind of brain that needs to verbally, you know, like in spoken speech, dump all the things right now, because otherwise, you know, it's like involves a whole lot of impulse control and working memory and executive functioning to like do the thing some other time. That's hard too, so kind of negotiating negotiating that and that comes up with a lot of my a lot of my patients too of especially when uh, when 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 both members of a relationship have um have, I mean it's conflicting access needs is really what it comes down to is that if I have the kind of brain that needs complete quiet at the same time that someone else has the kind of brain that needs to talk out loud right now like that is that, that, that's a conflicting access need, and it's not that one of us has, you know, our needs are more important than the other. Um, in the chat, um, picking the right time and space to talk about something important seems to be very important. Yeah, yeah, super well said. Um, and above that, taking for granted that we love each other and that most of our conflicts come from misunderstanding, not from us not loving each other. Um, taking space to process, reflective listening, another comment, asking many questions to get information, but sometimes that can be annoying. Oh yes, yes. Um, in, and, in, and in my house, and this doesn't relate to a uh, romantic relationship, but even just like my relationship with my five-year-old, I'm not allowed to ask questions. Our new thing is we actually, we made an access need board on the fridge um, and um, her access needs are to not have any unsolicited bids for attention. Like, like including like, don't wave to her in the morning. She flips her lid, it's violating her access needs. Cause she's thinking about something. She's like got something going on. And for me to say good morning is an interruption for her thing. So anyway, I've been trying to follow the thing on the access board um, and um, I'm not allowed to ask questions. I can wonder, I wonder if you want chocolate or vanilla ice cream, but I am not allowed to ask a direct question. It's a trigger, it's a limbic trigger and she doesn't, ooh, there's more people in the waiting room. Um, you got them? Yeah, I got them. All right, cool, yeah. Um, I wonder, so conflicting access needs, like as a theme, you know, we like that, I mean, I could talk about that all day. It's, it's, it's the key to the universe. I wonder how, 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 what, 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 uh, I'll start with the folks here on this, at the state house, um, conflicting access needs in relationships you've been. Yeah, Liam. My sibling and I have very conflicting needs and that has always put a strain on our relationship. And I don't know how to describe it. It's like basically everything that I need, she hates and vice versa. And I, I don't have a happy ending to this story. We just, we, just, we don't talk much anymore. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a work in progress. Yeah. Do you think that she recognizes the 
that it's a conflicting access needs problem? Because even getting to that stage might be really helpful. I'm not sure. I don't want to, I don't want to like assume that she's not aware, but I also don't want to assume that she is. I don't want to make an assumption or imply anything about her. I, so I really don't know. Yeah. Um, and I think that, because um, I talk with a lot of people personally and professionally who have strains in relationships um, and a, a conflicting access needs as a theme is just so common and mostly because we're not at a place where it's talked about a lot of times when you have to like frame it as an access need like everybody has access needs everybody needs something in order to meaningfully participate in their lives what's that oh my goodness ah hold on Absolutely. I'm gonna. What, are you still in the process of logging back on? But your mic should. If I switched, if I if we have Sierra's mic be the mic, would that be? Or it's connecting. It still says it's connecting. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. All right. How about now? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we are literally in the middle of a field and like pulling off this incredible thing. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so, uh, so, so an access need. Um, so an access need um, is what anyone needs to participate meaningfully in life. So this could be things in the physical environment, like um, I needed to be quiet in order for me to participate in the activity of thinking, um, <laughs> really. Um, um, uh, I, might need, I might need to know that someone likes me in order to feel safe in a relationship. Um, I might need closed captioning on when I'm participating in a Zoom meeting. So these are all, like, there's all different types of access needs. Um, and framing it that way can be really helpful. This is what I need in order to participate in this relationship, in this conversation, in this meeting. Um, and anyway, I um, just, just I, I, I wonder if, if that resonates with anybody else about like relationship strain related to two people needing things that conflict at the same time. There's some nodding heads here. Go ahead. I was just thinking about some examples of some dating experiences and um, I guess thinking about it with this kind of a sense of humor, but how I realized thinking back to a lot of experiences that I feel overwhelmed when there's maybe I get a certain type that is asking like if I'm getting asking multiple times a day like how are you feeling or we just got each other and I'm getting like are we a couple yet or or are we are we dating or what's our status or you know it's like 15 minutes later how are you feeling right now what's your status do you like me I don't know I like I don't know I get over extremely overwhelmed and want to just kind of run away but if I think about it a different way, like it doesn't mean anything is wrong with that person, that um, if you frame it, you know, as an access need, maybe there's a better way to communicate, you know, uh, I don't know. instead of running away. Run your way. I love that. I love that story. I'm thinking like, yep, that's pretty much, um, I've been the opposite side of that in like any dating relationship I'd ever been in before my husband. Cause like my access need is that, cause I think it's because I have the kind of brain that finds it really hard to know whether someone likes me or not. Um, I have a hard time interpreting 
um, uh, you know, like, like, not, I wouldn't say that I have a hard time interpreting expressions. It's that I take in too many expressions. I take in, like, so many, like, little things, and I'm, like, analyzing, like, what does that mean? And so, um, I'm just gonna assume that, like, when you, when I, when I saw that little mini furrow of your brow, that means you don't like me. Um, and that's, like, childhood trauma. That's, like, what goes on in the world of growing up neurodivergent. Anyway, um, um, one thing that that makes me think of is when um, in, we have some people saying same and relatable. So very common experience, it sounds like. Um, one thing that I have both found that worked in my relationship and talked to patients about is sometimes when there's that direct conflict and access need where like somebody needs quiet and somebody needs to be able to talk and share their whole day. Or in my case, I need like pretty constant communication to know that I'm somebody likes me and like we've said and my partner does not like communicating or texting especially virtual communication and so we settled on a compromise of three texts a day morning afternoon and night to like make sure that they're alive make sure that they still like me <laughs> and then they don't have to be texting me constantly and I don't have to worry oh they haven't texted me for two hours it means they hate me um, and so sometimes it's just being able to really kind of openly talk about those access needs and find the mic sounds fuzzy and in and out. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so sometimes it's just really communicating those. Well, I think another thing that this has been making me think of is sometimes I find that um, in relationships where people have conflicting access needs, it can be nice for people to take turns masking. I think that there's a, um, there's an assumption sometimes that like, perfect connections or perfect relationships mean that you should never have to mask and I think that's not always true um so much better awesome yeah, is better. um and sometimes it means one person taking a turn to like mask and not get their access needs met so the other person can fully get their needs met for 20 minutes and then you switch and being able to sometimes use that as a way to kind of get everything out. Oh, what is masking? It's a great question. Um, I, I think there's a lot, a lot of different views. I think of masking as a um, putting on a mask, whether it's act, carrying yourself a certain way, dressing a certain way, using certain facial expressions to appear mm, less neurodivergent, I guess, in this case. Um, I don't know if you have a... Yeah, and I would say that, that you might be... Dis I wonder if you're describing something about... Um, uh, just, like, as a negotiation strategy um, for... Um, like, it's kind of like... Uh, I don't care about... Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but I will watch an episode with Luna. I wouldn't necessarily think about that as masking. I would think about that as, like, I'm not torturing myself by watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, I'm just, like, suck... Ah! All right. All right. Am I back? Yeah? I'm looking at Laura Lewis. You're my like. You're my compass. You tell me whether the white. Okay, great. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's like, um, yeah, it's not. It doesn't give me dopamine. It's not particularly pleasing. But like, I really care about having a good connection with Luna. So I will watch this show, even though like. I have zero interest in it. Masking, I would like, w and and I guess I guess it's important. I think to, when people use any word, it's like, what do you mean? You know, tell me more about what you mean by that word. And so when m I think people mean different things by that word. Um, so I wonder the way you used it, Sierra. Was it kind of like the way I was just describing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle thing, as opposed to? Masking, I guess, as an almost an emotional suppression or suppressing your like native reaction where if um, somebody wants to kind of ramble on about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and I'm not excited about it, I'm not going to say, oh, I'm not excited about this. I'm just going to leave. I'm just going to sit and listen because that's what's going to make my kid happy or whatever. Right. And I think that when... Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. Yes, so, here so for me, this is kind of dovetailing really well with the idea that idea of perspective taking 
um, because, um, like, if I'm, for example, watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to experience the experience it from the perspective of someone I care about and experience what it's like to be this person I care about and how and experience the world through their eyes that's a that's a um, that's a re that's a relationship building thing and it's also a, a like a building thing in me like I get to experience the world from a different way of being and the the, the just to, to totally wing off on this, but um, the, the thing that sort of, the really geeky part that, that I kind of love about the perspective taking thing is like, I mean, this is, it's it, like, it's how Einstein discovered relativity. It's like he experienced, he looked, he, it's like everybody else looked at the world of subatomic particles as like big people who, and, and, and through the, what it was like to be a subatomic particle from the perspective of massive, beings and Einstein looked at the world he discovered relativity by looking at the world of subatomic particles through the world of subatomic particles and so and and what would it be like to be a subatomic particle if I were a subatomic particle how would I experience the universe and so what we're really talking about we're talking about this incredible strategy this incredible way of experiencing life and and so it, I, I guess in some ways, if I do this, this if I, I some some ways, if I think, well, I'm I'm suppressing myself, but in other another way, I'm I'm really I'm sort of I, well, I'm turning myself into a pretzel, but 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 to experience the world in, through a lens that I couldn't experience it unless I turned myself into a pretzel. Einstein was autistic. Yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, you just made me care about physics <laughs> for the first time in my life. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, comment in the chat. For me, uh, masking is sometimes matching the energy of the people around me so as to not upset them. Yeah, um, and I think that, so, and, and there was another comment in the chat a couple of ago about masking as a survival strategy. So when we talk about that masking, like we really wanna discourage masking for purposes of like, I have to hide my true self in order to survive. Like, um, you gotta leave that environment. And it's unfortunate because there's so many people who don't have control over their environment. So masking as a survival strategy, um, like it's not safe to unmask. Um, and this comes up in all kinds of settings and it's because people don't really understand brains. They don't understand what, you know, they don't understand what stimming is. They don't understand what dysregulation manifestations look like across people in different settings. And it becomes, it really is a survival strategy. Um, comment in the chat. I think the default is that the neurodivergent person needs a mask or to change to meet a neurotypical person's needs. I like the idea that the responsibility is on both people to worry about meeting the other person's needs. Yeah, yeah. In order and meeting your own needs um, in order to fit in and be liked. Yes, Leah, right, exactly. So so um, many people grow up. There's a, a video that I think uh, that I, 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 I don't remember when I played it. It might have been in Internalized Shame uh, Brain Club a couple months ago. Um, I'll find it. Um, where there's a kid, like a middle school kid giving a talk. I don't know if anybody was at that brain club. Um, the middle schooler talking about, like, masking to fit in and be liked and it was like the saddest video but i mean i mean there's kindergartners who mask already um because the message is is being given explicitly or implicitly that somebody's fundamental way of being in the world is wrong and broken and needs to be trained out of and that's that's not good for mental health like at all and, and 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 masking or camouflaging sometimes it's it's um it's it's referred to and just a a, a a a trigger warning briefly for the concept of suicide um but masking and camouflaging is there's research that shows that that is independently correlated with suicidality and so anytime people are being given the message that 
they need to hide their true selves. It's 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 very bad for mental health. Real quick, Laura, go ahead. The other thing that I think is frightening is that I think masking is the primary message being put out there in like marriage counseling and couples counseling. Like if you have a neuromixed couple, it seems like that's the go-to mentality is that the that one partner needs to mask and that will solve the problems. And it seems like that just makes everything a lot worse. Yes, right. And that's this, this double empathy problem is, is really turning that on its head. So many people who end up in traditional marriage counseling, couples counseling, whatever that it, what Laura said, that is the message that, that people get. And, you know, I hear this from my patients all the time. Um, and it's, right, it's terrible advice. Um, and it's that, you know, this person needs to change. This person needs to do the thing. And as though there's one thing to be done, Laura, I'm wondering, can you speak at all about, about your, about your research, research study? study? about the neuromixed couples? I would find that so interesting related to this. Yeah, so um, the study that I did was on um, neuro, I shouldn't even say neurotypical partners, but people who identify themselves as neurotypical and identify their partners as neurodivergent. Um, this was all by self-report, so I didn't, and I think one of the really important disclaimers right off the cuff is that a lot of the people who I interviewed, so these are like the, the supposed NT partners, the neurotypical partners, um, a lot of their partners weren't even self-diagnosed. So these are partners that are saying, I think my partner is autistic. Um, but basically what these participants were, were sharing with me was um, that things went really well in their relation. I'm sorry, I've got some noise in the background. Things went really well if they looked at their partner as an equal and they saw it as this mutual reciprocity type relationship where they're a team and they each hang on, bud. they each have needs and those needs are different and that's normal and that's okay. Um, but the more that they looked at their partner's needs as being logical, the more that they viewed it as like they are they are disordered and they have a problem. Um, the more the more toxic the relationship, relationship being, being no surprise, um, and the less and less happy the the person who identified as not autistic became in the relationship. Um, I could go into a lot more detail, but that's the gist of it. Yeah, and that 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 makes so much sense. That if you view someone you're in a relationship with as having uh, a pathology, like that's not gonna. That, that, that doesn't really contribute very well to co-regulation um and it it's disappointing and and not surprising um one of the other things that happens also is that there is and, and again this is this is i think going back to brain rules of what it means to be an adult there are so many brain rules about what it means to be an adult so often um people share with me, well, you know, my husband should be able to do the thing because he's an adult or, you know, my partner should be able to do the thing because they're, you know, they're a parent and this is what parents do. Like just brain rules of like what it means to, to, to be a person. Um, like when, when really we're really talking about, guess what? One in five people has executive functioning differences, at least, you know, so being an adult, um, what, when people use that, they are often referring to, like, this is what it looks to have typical executive functioning skills, but many people do not. Um, in the chat, there are so many marriage and couples counseling books and messages out there that basically focus on how to work together to, quote, help the autistic person to basically look less autistic in essence just totally ignoring that person's needs yeah yeah and um that that's not good for the health of the couple for the health of the individual for the couple of all the of, for the for the people in all the couple's lives yeah i wonder in zoom world um the the idea of like so just we have we have about 15 minutes left is there anything that's standing out to folks about access needs perspective taking brain rules or something else we haven't talked about entirely about about relationships that that is on anyone's mind 
feel free to i'm actually looking at the screen if you oh laura go ahead i'm sorry i feel like i'm dominating but one more thing from my research i just feel like is really important to say is that there are a lot of online support groups out there for neurotypical partners of um, autistic or neurodivergent folks and there, I would just sit, tell people, like if you're in a relationship and your partner's thinking about those or you're thinking about those, to be really, really cautious. Um, a lot of them are actually kind of hate groups in disguise as support groups. Um, and they end up being a lot of venting and bashing and negative stereotyping and um, pretty toxic places. So I would just really caution people before going to those as a place of actual support. Thank you for saying that. Linda. So I have I want to share some advice that my dad gave me for anyone who needs to hear it. This is a dad speaking, and I'll share my dad with you. He said to me, Linda Beth, just because everyone tells you you're wrong, it does not mean that you are in fact wrong. So take that. Amen. Yes. Yes. Um, I think that there's also this element of just um, learning to trust your intuition. Like a lot of people who get the message over a course of a lifetime that 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 you're wrong, you're doing it wrong, you don't know the thing. Like you 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 really predictably lose touch with intuition. Um, and a lot of times it's like, oh, well, you know, it's just, maybe it's just me, but, or, and, and really like the invalidation from the environment leads to self-invalidation of not, not trusting your instinct. Go ahead, Liam. Um, I was told that basically my whole life by schools, when people would have conflicts with me, I was always the one in the wrong from their eyes, always the one who just misunderstood. And it, and it finally I realized how ridiculous it was in my first year of university. I was told, well, why did you expect people to follow quiet hours? And I was like, those are the established rules. This time it is not me. And now I'm, I'm able to see a little bit better sometimes when it really isn't just me. Books ever um, is Brene Brown's. I thought it was just me, but it isn't. Um, and like talking about shame, shame the you know the profoundly you know the powerful negative emotion of feeling defective and deficient. And like one of the most powerful things you can do when you recognize feeling shame is to tell someone else because almost always they will say, "Me too," and then the shame is like automatically dissipated like pretty quickly um, in the chat. I think it's less that specifically um, and more that neurotypical is the default. And so we're all taught to act neurotypically. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Leah. I mean, when um, uh, often we get um, we get calls and emails from community members being like, do you teach social skills like no, um, we do not. We bring people together based on their sheer interest because guess what? There is not a universal like default set of social skills. When you bring people together based on shared interests, you talk about access needs and you, you know, you don't violate people's access needs, other people's access needs. That's the only world rule of social skills um, is, yeah. Um, we had um, one, one of our one of our junior advisory council members, a nine-year-old, I said, what do you think we should do to help kids feel like they belong? And the sweet little love said, you just let us do what we love. What? Like, what do you mean? And he's like, if I just, if you just let me do what I love and you let that kid do what they love, like, we're gonna feel like we belong. Whoa. Like, really, it really, it really is that that simple um and so when you like bring people together in like a group and you're like oh all you you don't know how to do that thing let me train you how to do the neurotypical social skill thing like guess what not good for mental health in the chat i i'm having trouble scrolling um um yeah, I think the chat was talking a little bit about being shocked that their advice 
um, that there is advice telling people to pretend to be something that they're not in an intimate relationship. Um, and Laura had said that it's the default in the medical model. The focus is on treatment rather than co-adaptation and accepting differences. And then social skills is a limited meeting in the neurotypical world. Absolutely. And uh, David wrote um, that this is very helpful. My oldest kid's partner is autistic and they mask all the time and is moving in. It will help me understand that I need to tell them that they don't need to mask. Oh, that would be the, like, like uh, the single most beautiful and supportive thing. And it's possible that that, that person has never been told that ever. Um, what, what a gift that you will be to them. Anything, yeah, go ahead, yeah. I was just um, thinking about um, this, maybe the success rate for couples when they're both neurodivergent. Like I've, I've been thinking for a while, is that that's like the only way to go? I mean, I'm not saying the only way, but uh, would it make things a lot easier, you know, um, in terms of being understood? a sound issue. Nina, I think what I heard you say um, was that I, I was picking up context clues because it was breaking up every other word, but that there's an alternative to being told that people need social skills training. Is that what you were saying? Or did I miss that? Entirely. If if, if I <laughs> something way different, I was really shocked. Really really I guess. Would you would you mind saying it one more? Would you mind? I'm I'm sorry to ask you to repeat yourself. I want to make sure, sure. I you. No problem. <laughs> yeah, I was just I've been thinking for uh, over a while. Like, is it just much easier? Just you know, what are the success rates when the couple when they're both neurodivergent? You know what I mean? We talked about people that are neurotypical, talk to people who are, I guess, mixed um, in terms of their, you know, status. But I mean, is, is it, does that make things like dramatically easier? I feel like I, I connect more naturally to people that are also neurodivergent. Neurokin, absolutely. Um, so um, I think it depends on where people are their own self-awareness in any type of relationship if you can if you're if you come to understand your own brain your own needs and you're working on niche construction designing your life based on your brain's needs in your environment in your relationships in your work in your play and your everything like yeah that works out pretty well um when we have um situations where there are you know multiple neurodivergent partners um, and one is coming to self-awareness and others are not just not in that place of the journey. Um, that is when there can be some of the most um, rigid adherence to brain rules because brain rules, we all make brain rules and in, 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 in life because brain rules make us feel safe and we hold on to them when we feel unsafe. And if a brain rule is helping you, you keep it. If a brain rule is not helping you, you might consider making a new brain rule. Um, but um, and, and this will come up, I think, in, um, in two weeks when we have the neurodiversity and employment brain club um uh i have so many stories where like people will be like well i got fired from this job or like oh you know this conflict with my boss and it's like yep that was possibly multiple neurodivergent people with brain rules with conflicting access needs um and some of them knew it and some of them didn't um but remember we're talking about one in five people um who thinks learns communicates in a way that substantially departs from the like so-called typical brain but that's, i don't think that's a thing but the brain that like society has deemed um you know story yeah the story that's been created that's exactly exactly right um yeah, um, um, so so um, autistic adults being to uh, taught their whole life to act a certain way, so it's like stunting growth, never able to develop a true self until um, 
until there's often some kind of critical shifting point. And I'm just going up to Megan's point. As an autistic adult, please keep space for people who continue to mask. Often it's unintentional after so many years of having to have learned social skills, a.k.a. masking. Hard to turn it off. Absolutely. Um, and um, often, so in, in my experience, and this is certainly my experience as an autistic adult, um, and it's the experience of many of my patients, people first learn that they are autistic in the context of something called autistic burnout, which is um, uh, reaching you know profound levels of dopamine deficiency, dysregulation, mismatch from the environment and the people in it, that basically it's a disintegration of executive functioning, and you need executive functioning skills to mask. And so when you lose the ability to mask, that is often when people um, may be more likely to manifest more, quote, stereotypical medical model definitions of autism. That's how I got my diagnosis. Um, and, you know, I, I started showing up the way I show up now, but I didn't used to show up that way. I used to have, like, a pretty intense, like, very just so kind of professional mask because in the medical environment it is completely unsafe to be anything else you are actively shamed for anything else So I really appreciate everybody coming um, um, in Zoom here on the Steed House. A big thank you to Orca Media for making this possible. And um, I'm super excited that um, this is our largest ever brain club. Like, this is so cool. And, you know, um, I th and, 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 and people say it can't be done that there's always a default and then like a sidebar but i don't i don't think it's necessarily true and i really appreciate all of you being here tonight to make that so thanks everyone and we hope to see you next tuesday um uh for more more neurodiversity and uh family dynamics next week um and the week after neurodiversity and employment Ah. Thanks, everybody. Bye.